You are listening to the Palestine in America podcast. The following episode is from our highly anticipated food edition. Marcel Efram is the transgender Palestinian American chef behind Shababi Palestinian Chicken. Efram, who had previously run the kitchen at one of DC's most famous Michelin star restaurants, left Maidan during the pandemic to serve Sechan style whole rotisserie chicken with Palestinian spices and cooked until juicy and tender at a pop-up. Ephraim joined the Palestine in America podcast to discuss Shababi's success and turning it into a brick and mortar, their identity, and their experience as a Palestinian chef in the U.S. Marcel, welcome. Hello. So excited to have you. So Marcel is our feature uh, our main feature for this edition of Palestine in America for our food issue. We're so excited to have them on. Uh, Marcel is a well-respected chef in the DC area, worked at a Michelin star restaurant as executive chef for a while before branching out on their own. And that is when I met them, when they had their pop-up Shababi chicken. Uh, which was in Sechan style chicken. And uh, you'll read more about it in the feature article that I wrote uh, in the edition. But, you know, we're going to talk to Marcel and, you know, get to know them and their background being Palestinian, how they got into food, uh, and what really motivates them, you know, to continue to do this work. Um, obviously, I mean, I, Marcel has come to some of my pop ups in DC, which is like a huge honor. Uh, to have like such an amazing chef uh, attend my events. But obviously we've had a lot of food conversations. You know, we've talked about a lot of different things like making room for other Palestinians at the table, you know, being there and being supportive for people. But before we get into those kinds of subjects, we're gonna start super basic. So where is your family from in Palestine? Okay, so um, my family, so my, uh, Grandparents um, were in the Nakba, and uh, so they, them and their parents, um, and most of their parents, uh, are from Beit Jala, Bethlehem, and Yapa. Um, and then part of my family actually uh, immigrated from northern Mesopotamia in the late 1800s, and that's where they met my family that was established in Palestine. Um, so. Uh, yeah, that's essentially where we're from. Okay. And uh, like, what was the story of exile? Where did they land? Where did they end up? How did they come to America? Uh, my mom's family went to Beirut. Uh, my dad's family went to Damascus. Um, my parents uh, were both there into my dad into his later teenage years and my mom um, into her preteen years. Uh, mom's family and dad's family both came to the States in the 70s. Okay. Uh, Mom's family went to New Jersey. My dad's family came here to the DC area. Okay. And we had some family that uh, had already kind of made their way. And, you know, of course, uh, everybody coming over because they have a ton of siblings. My mom's the youngest of nine, and my dad's the second to youngest of what? eight. So, <laughs> yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow, that is so crazy. Yeah. Um, so, when were you first like aware of your Palestinian identity? Was it something that you grew up with or was it something that you kind of grew into later on in life? So my parents um, were always working when I was younger, you know, um, and my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, my Sido had a really big hand in raising me. I, along with my dad's um, old, second to oldest sis sister. Um, and my Sido, I was just like on his hip constantly, you know, and he was a very, very proud man and uh, very, he was actually, I didn't learn until later in life illiterate, which like really blew my mind because he was just probably in like one of the most intellectual people I'd ever known, you know, and he was just so proud and, and so mesmerizing with his storytelling. He was actually a, uh, tour bus driver when he was back in Palestine and uh, carried that profession over when they um, were refugees in Damascus at some point uh, many years later once they had settled um, 
I don't think he was actually able to reestablish that until 10 years after they'd been in Damascus. But um, so, you know, kind of that energy of what you would imagine a tour bus driver kind of storyteller, um, you know, he, he really imparted so much of that pride onto me from a really young age, you know, and there's this beautiful naivety when you're young and you don't really understand the world of bigotry around you, you know? So I think there's a sense of like pride in its purest form, especially when you look up to the person who is instilling the pride in you. you yeah. Um, so his story would range from, you know, everything from the fresh fruit to the chicken, uh, to the landscape and to activities and to, you know, going to the water and it was just so encompassing. And that really was my first foundation in uh, my Palestinian pride. Mm -hmm. That's and amazing. Did, and then how did you get into food? What, how did that become your thing? It's really the only thing I knew how to do. Um, my parents, like I said, they were in the industry. Uh, they, when they, you know, they met here in the States and then, um, well, they got married here in the States and uh, within the first year that they were married, they'd opened up a mom and pop shop in Tacoma Park, Maryland. And, uh, you know, it was like subs and pizza and mom would make like traditional Arab dishes <laughs> alongside it all. Uh, and they really hit it off and they had that space for a while. And then they kind of started to venture into other mom and pop uh, concepts. Um, always having like, you know, our food on the menu. And so I started working um, with people. And, uh, you know, you know only, an Arab kid good say, <laughs> only an Arab kid yeah. can say they worked full time at 10 years yeah. old. Like, it's how totally much normal. Is that? Totally normal. You, know, <laughs> you know, because it was good for me, right? Like, <laughs> uh, it was, it was funny because my younger siblings who would always be there, uh, whenever I was like, well, why aren't they working? They're like, haram, like, no, leave them alone. <laughs> I don't. This is this is what being uh, how old is. You? Yeah. yeah, like it's that's fun. crazy. You know, yeah. What, what kind of what kind of uh, Arabic dishes would they have on the menu at the at like the sub and pizza spot? I'm curious. Mom would like. Yeah. <laughs> it was like really like mom's inspiration, right? So like whatever she was feeling like in the moment, she like actually said that the first thing she did was fiha and like they got demolished. And so she couldn't keep up with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so she was always really known for that. And they would do actually like, I didn't even realize it, but I, it's so interesting. I'm sorry. I speak in tangents. Gina, and you know that. Yes. I go all over go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> it's a good so, podcast. Listen to apologies. Podcast. This is literally what a podcast is, right? <laughs> Just go on tangents. They want to hear from you, not from us. <laughs> you know, there's, it's really interesting, right? Because I feel like I, so many moments, like later on in my life, we'll get there in my career, whatever. But in that uh, kind of like personal self-discovery of trying to like reclaim my roots, get back to who I am and my people and the food I want to do. I started doing these things and you know you don't really know like I think at some point when you're doing food for so long just like any other profession <clears throat> you uh become immersed with the language of it right so things kind of become second nature oftentimes you're like people ask like how were you inspired to do that and you're like I don't really know I just know the language of this so there's kind of like this mathematical thing that happens right where you just put two and two together and you do these things and really that started happening where I was like, this just feels natural, right? Uh, including like the inspiration of the Musakhan for Shababi. And mom's like, yeah, I was doing those chicken dishes when you were growing up and yeah. selling them at the restaurant. And it's not like I have a clear recollection of that specifically because the restaurant aspect and being with them in those spaces was really like hustle bustle. It was work, you know? So though like I... In retrospect, when she reminds me that like some of the things I'm doing now she had done, I was like, oh, wow, that like makes a lot of sense. And then I can, you know, sort of remember those things, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was 
honestly, like uh, my family in general, specifically the matriarchs were just um, incredible cooks. And mm-hmm. I think we all can relate to that. And I, I think from a food inspiration standpoint, like between my grandfather's stories and like being at the feet of my maternal grandmother, um, when we would go to see her in New Jersey, like I would wake up at 5 a.m. with her just so I could just, and she wouldn't let me do anything, you right. know? She like, just like so reserved, but just being enamored with uh, <clears throat> all of those things. And I think my clearest recollection of the food that I thought was like my truest inspiration and initially, but then I, you know, now realize it's more encompassing uh, to what I'm doing now um, was really watching her feed an infinite amount of people, you know, in like yeah. beautiful way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, that is, it's true actually. And a lot of our memories tend to be ingrained in certain moments like that, right? So when I think of like my first introduction to food, it's always like my grandma being in the kitchen, kneading out the dough to make like menaish or, you know, sfiha. And yes, you're not allowed to touch anything, but you can just sit there still yeah. and just observe, right? It's just like you're watching like a play almost, you know, they had like their own methods and they had their techniques and it was so like ingrained in them. Like it was like second nature. And like the smells, right? Like the sounds, like those are so, uh, they're, I don't know, they really just stamp, those memories have just like stamped themselves on me, you know? <clears throat> and it's interesting because I, as far as a lot of like watching my grandmother and those recipes, <clears throat> I feel like I started to try to imitate just based on those like five, six, seven year old memory, like being a you know, a five-year-old and trying Mm -hmm. to remember the smells and like what she did with her hands. And um, yeah, it just so impactful. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you worked obviously in a lot of places, a lot of restaurants, you were at Maidan, which for people who don't know in the DMV does have like, you know, Middle Eastern influence, mostly like Lebanese Syrian style. Um, and then you opened Shababi Chicken literally during the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> when everybody else was like hiding, you were like, I'm gonna open up this pop up and start serving rotisserie style of sachan spiced chicken. Yeah. With like amazing sides like French onion lebne, which is by far literally mm-hmm. like, I crave it. And I can't wait for you to finally open your place so I can come get it all the time. So like what what drew you to do that? Obviously you were influenced a lot but you know by your grandparents cooking growing up but like why launch it at that time like in such a difficult time for other people you know when everybody was kind of you know taking a step back from things you actually you know decided to go the opposite direction. Well there <laughs> I, I tell my dad all this time that he like trained the best donkey you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just like <Right>. in London <laughs> but no I mean it 2020 right like what a year of facing ourselves you know and um to say that <clears throat> I was I I found myself in 2020, you know? I think being faced with this crisis, you know, and the world around us shutting down, uh, it made me face myself in ways that I'd never considered before, you know? Um, I realized I was transgender uh, in 2020 and that, at 35 years uh, and that really opened up this like gateway to my like journey to to authenticity you know and I was done with fabrications I was done with not being able to 
or not saying not necessarily not being able to but the, like limitations on my storytelling and who I was as a person you know and I just wanted myself to get to know the real me and I wanted um everyone around me as well you know uh yeah, I mean, I was running Maidan in 2020, and it was definitely, it was like the, I was at, before that, I was at Blue Jacket Brewery for six years. I also developed a really bad drinking problem. Um, and the pandemic hit a few months after I took the position at Maidan. Um, it was my first time professionally cooking Arab-esque food. Um, you know, part of my family is Assyrian and there was a lot of focus in my career on that. And when I would bring a Palestinian throughout my career, there was just like, you no know, hesitations from the people around me. That alongside really like finding myself and facing myself. And, you know, I uh, quit drinking. I've been sober for two years. Um, I was just like, I need to control my own narrative, you know? Mm -hmm. And my Palestinian roots were the thing that I felt like I was closest to, you know? It was what I was raised with. It was also something that I felt like needed reclamation in every aspect for any person that might have a soapbox, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And I knew I did. Like, uh, my following on social media was getting bigger. Um, I was getting some... You know, I was getting a lot of local attention, some national attention, and uh, I just saw it as an opportunity to tell my narrative. So going back to why I did Shababi, I came home in October of 2020 and I go to my wife, I'm like, I know I'm running a Michelin star restaurant, but I live, hear me out. I got this idea for chicken and French fries. <laughs> chicken and French fries. What? <laughs> she was like, all right. I was like, cool. Uh, so I left me down in December 2020. A um, friend of mine had a deli space in Alexandria. Uh, January, we launched it. Uh, it went nuts. I was not expecting it to go over as well as it did. Um, it was really important for me to say, you know, this is Palestinian inspired. It was called Shababi Palestinian Chicken. Um, it was at first I wanted to do Masakhan. But then I was like, this is like also really reminiscent of the stories my grandfather would tell me about rotisserie chicken in the West Bank. Uh, so it ended up being kind of like a merging of those two ideas. Um, and my wife, who had just got out of the industry, uh, I would go home and I'm like, I think I'm a little over my head with this. I need your help. She was studying for a real estate license, poor thing. Oh, and so she stopped what she was doing and she came and helped me. And something that we had only planned to run for like a couple of months, we ended up running for nine. We got nominated for a bunch of local awards. We got recognized for it. Um, I don't know. It was pretty wild. Like uh, it was the first year I took control of my own narrative and the reception was the best that I've ever gotten for anything I've done in my career, you know? And um, yeah. <laughs> you I know being that? authentic and true to yourself, you know, mm -hmm. like it's such a wonderful feeling when people accept that part of you, right? Yeah. And, you yeah. know, having have, having to have ha hid your identity as a Palestinian, you know, in the food industry, because we know how the food industry is, especially in DC, to be honest. Yeah. Right. So like you and I both kind of have the same outlook when it comes to how we proclaim our food, you know, like I make sure that my pop ups and everything that I talk about related to my food is Palestinian food, because there's so many restaurants that are trying to pass off our food as, you know, Israeli. Yeah, Israeli or just Arab or, you know, there's this like monolith that is assumed upon our people, you know, like the the, the lack of understanding of the diversity amongst you know, not even people just by nationality, but even within those nationalities, how many diverse groups there are, you know, mm -hmm. there's just this real homogenization of anyone that's Arab, yeah. <laughs> you know? And exactly. there's so many com complexities and 
like it deserves each each person and each story deserves its space right because it tells the story of complexity and it ultimately like helps us reflect ourselves for our people you know and I like I didn't have any role models growing up like I, I didn't you know there's nobody that I could relate to in any sense you know I don't know like yeah I, I just think it the and I've talked to you about this Gina and it's like for me in all of this the word is reclamation you know I don't claim that I have my it's all good to me and it's all my narrative, right? Like my parents owned a diner, so that's why I like this upcoming Jababi Diner and I'm doing Knif waffles, right? Like, like there there's nothing quote unquote authentic about that, but it, it's like authentic to my experience, right? And it tells my particular story. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Now, did you have something you were gonna say earlier? Yeah, I was going to basically, uh, not to harp on this, but basically ask if, you know, finding yourself and, and being, you know, open about yourself helped improve your skill. Like being, op did that free up some, something inside of you to kind of take your skill to the next level? I know you're already successful in your industry, but at that moment, did you feel that you ascended to another level? Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, because it just got to the point where like I I I I gained confidence in myself and like had a new sense of respect for myself, you know, um, that I didn't have before. I'm not saying that I don't still suffer from imposter syndrome because a lot of it always feels unreal. And I think that mm. as a people in general, we're very humble, you know? So it's like a cultural trait right like to feel like to feel like you you owe everything to to everybody else mm -hmm. and to some degree I, I do right but like I, it also made me realize that I know what I'm doing you know and I I'm controlling what I'm doing and it's the reception was amazing and the people that wanted to <clears throat> I'm not saying it's like all of the confidence came from the reception because it was certainly um, I essentially was in the clearest mind frame to do what I wanted to do. So it all made sense and the clarity absolutely the chips fell into place in a way that I don't think it would have if I wasn't um, you know on this journey of like being true to myself. It's really beautiful. Thanks. And thank you for sharing that with us. You know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. we don't take that for granted or lightly. Thank you. Thank you. Exactly, absolutely. So <clears throat> obviously like, you know, when we discussed this in the interview previous to this, we talked about having to hide your identity. And obviously you've discussed a little bit about you know, how Shababi came out and how mm -hmm. you yourself came to a lot of realizations. But obviously there's like opportunities that have come, right? Specifically, I think you've been up to the White House twice yeah. now, right? Yeah. And under the premise of something else, but yet you were still adamant about making sure to bring Palestine to the table. So can you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, for sure. I mean... <clears throat> The first opportunity I got was um, in June of uh, 2021 to sit at a round table uh, with five other members of the LGBTQ community to talk with uh, Vice President Kamala Harris about queer issues in our spaces. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, <laughs> Uh, Sorry. Yeah, I was like, I make chicken. I don't know what you want from me, but so that was like definitely <laughs> through me at first. But <clears throat> um, it was 
a difficult decision to decide to sit at the table, first and foremost, uh, for a multitude of reasons. I didn't want it to seem as an endorsement of this uh, administration. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that I align myself with most politicians. You know, I uh, think that everybody needs to do more. We know the track record of the vice president, uh, specifically when it comes to Palestinian issues. But that being said, I knew that it was an opportunity to have my voice at a table. And I didn't go there under the guise of speaking for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. I went there saying that I know what I can say from my perspective. Um, and I, of course, wanted to be super transparent about it, you know, after the fact and, and during. So, yeah, I mean, it was interesting, you know, I sat right next to her. My uh, place card said my name um, with Shababi Palestinian chicken. Um, so it was a round table. It, uh, I had, you know, probably five minutes to talk. So I spoke about a multitude of things, you know, um, queer rights in the restaurant industry. Um, you know, specifically, I definitely brought up uh, our census status. <laughs> yep. I think that there's not, you know, enough visibility from a social sense uh, that can create access for us, right? Because, you know, we are a unique group and we are different than other groups and we deserve to have things specifically designed for us in those arenas, in my opinion. Uh, and I brought up Palestine and I was really surprised at myself and the way I was able to hold myself through the conversation. She took notes, you know, she talked to me. Uh, it was a conversation. I don't know how much it resonated, um, but nonetheless, like, I don't think I could have passed an opportunity like that for a multitude of reasons, mm -hmm. you know, that being one of the first that there was, it was the first round, round table specifically discussing queer rights um, ever in the history of, you know, U.S. government, yeah. with civilians, as we are. Uh, and I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it impacted change. I don't know, you know, but I, I know that I went there to uh, speak my mind and that's what I did. Uh, the second opportunity came up a few, couple of months ago at the vice president's residency for a pride event, which was really difficult to stomach, you know, yeah. and I talked to family and friends about it, you know, before I decided to go, it was like a hard decision to make, you know, it, I just didn't feel like we were in a celebratory time. I still don't, you know, I'm like, if you're throwing a party, give me that money. <laughs> like, what? you know what I mean? Like, what are we doing? Yeah. Uh, I have, I've been in correspondence with her, uh, with her people here and there via email um, the past year. Whenever I think of something, I just email them and I'm like, hey, there's this thing that I think is important. I don't know where it falls, but you know, I, I take that opportunity to use that as I can. Uh, and so, yeah, so I went to this thing, this Pride event, whatever, I was just standing there and she was speaking at the podium and she recognized me after she spoke and called me over and I was surprised she remembered my name you know, and it was uh, very, and I, I, leading up to it, I was like, if I get, I thought there'd be like a photo op opportunity, you know, and I wasn't going to like put myself, I didn't know what the, they don't really give you much information when they invite you to these things until you get there. So it was like, I don't know if they're going to like have people like go up and take photos. You know what I mean? So I uh, was like, there might be an opportunity to see her. So what do I say? What do I say? What do uh -huh. I say? I'm like, my brain is like 
going because at that point I'm like angry, you know, like I'm not, I'm, I'm angry with the status of the world, you know, and I have a lot to say. And so, yeah, so she saw me, she remembered me, she called me over and uh, I just kind of like just blurted everything that was on my head. Like I just, I just went at it and she was just like, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And at some point she was like, you know, I was, I was telling her about the restaurant and the space and what we're doing. And she's like, oh, that's great. Like, you know, we'd love to go there. And at some point she says like, right before she was like telling someone to take a photo or somebody was like, take a photo. And uh, she, she like called me my friend and I was like, I'm free Palestine, right? My friend. <laughs> She said that? Well, I said that. She oh. called And I was like, the free toss, like, right, my friend? And then those were photos. Oh, my God. But she, like, shot I don't know. Photo, like... All over the place. My brain was going a million miles per hour. I really didn't get think that I was going to get the opportunity to have as much time as I did with her and for it to be so candid. And I was, like, and talking to about... remember your name. That's yeah, uh, that's, yeah, that was you made an impression, you know. And I was like talking about the inflation of bean prices and how hard it is to open something up right now with how expensive everything is. I'm pretty sure I said not all of us are millionaires, you know. Like, I was just, yeah, so yeah, you check yeah. a lot of boxes for her entrepreneur, yeah. <laughs> <It's>, you know. <laughs> wow, I have a friend who calls me the bingo card. <laughs> oh, god. Like anything to land on anything. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. So I mean, I understand my by all means. You know what I mean? Come on. Like I, I get it and I see it, but also I can't like take it for granted that I have this proximity to say things, whether they're hurt or not, right? Like I I just feel like it's an opportunity so many would wish for and I don't know if I'm doing the right thing with them. I hope I am. And like I said, I'm not trying to speak for everyone. I just know what's pressing in my eyes, right? And what I can say, so I try to. Yeah, people have a different, you know? people mm -hmm. criticize people who take the advantage of those situations kind of rub me the wrong way. Um, especially yeah. when you're mm -hmm. taking advantage of the situation and not just taking it for granted. Like if you just went there and had a good time, then, you know, any criticism that is thrown your way might be valid, but you didn't. That's not what the purpose of you going was. You know, you had the right intentions and intentions. A lot of time people don't look at what the intentions are. So, and they just yeah. want to criticize just to criticize, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I 100% agree. And it's like, ultimately, like, you know, what what's, I think that, in the best case scenario, it's just opening more, more doors for more of us to be in those situations that we can be in those situations in numbers. Mm -hmm. And then I don't look like an idiot when I'm rambling about bean inflation. <laughs> it's all important, man. Bean inflation is important. Otherwise, we're not going to get to eat him. <laughs> we're not going to be able to make know, homeless. Right? That's going to be a I'm problem. Stocking up. That's a major problem. <laughs> Okay, well then speaking of food, let's segue into like a lighter topic. What is your favorite Palestinian dish? One. Everybody. All right, you could give us many. Yeah. I mean, I know it's very hard to choose okay. this one. I'm gonna or, or let's I'm do gonna... this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Give us your top five and start in a set like in sending order five. <laughs> <Top five. laughs> you have it in your back pocket. You're so confident you could like just one. Give us five. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what my favorites are. I don't know how many they are, but like overall, I think za'atar is like the most important, one of the most important things in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm totally taken for granted. And like from a complexity standpoint, it's not oregano. You know what I mean? Like stop. Like it's not like <laughs> oregano. <laughs> like it's not. I hate yeah. when people do that. Yeah. yeah. But I think that my kid is uh, my stepson, um, my wife's biological son, but in my image, you know, he's been mine since he was eight years old. He's 19 years old now. He kid will put Zathar on everything, which I like adore, you know, and he's like showing it to people and he's like, you don't know what you're missing out on. And that's awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that 
it's one of those beautiful things that just goes on everything and the complexities and especially like, hey, shout out Z and Z. Yes, and, you know, yes, we the already interviewed Danny. Yeah. yeah, they're also in the magazine. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, Nabulsi style knepe. Mm. Right. And that's it, Nabulsi style knepe. Yeah. Sorry, There's nothing the better. People need to know. The people need to know. Yeah. Like, that is just, it's just so. It's nothing like it. There's just nothing like it. And I'm like uh, lactose intolerant and celiacs, but like I'll make an exception. Lactose know? intolerant as the Arabs, <laughs> like I think we all are. We all sacrifice it for the cheese. Well, I have a Not thing me. that about that. <laughs> because my parents have four children and all of us are lactose intolerant and they're fine. And I'm like, that because we're not eating the same dairy here. And most of the dairy back home is not from cow's milk unless it's like in cheese, maybe. Mm-hmm. You're right. right. Yeah. I could be totally wrong, but who knows? What else? Uh, Anything else? Well, okay. Also Palestinian olive oil. Like Palestinian olive oil is like definitely like top tier. Top tier. Whether it's like from unripened olives, you know, that like super spicy style oil. Fantastic. And also cooking with olive oil. I know this is getting a little more like technical, but like cooking with olive oil, like we do, because you know, there's like a stigma here, right? About cooking with olive oil. Yeah. Right. Like, that's just like when I learned about that, I thought that was the most bizarre thing in the world. I like the what thing, do you, I don't, what do you I, use? What's vegetable oil? Like these like hydrogenated oils. So, so there's this thing that I started hearing like early on in my career, like mid early 2000s. And they're like, you can't get olive oil up to a temperature, right? Because if fumigates yeah. like it, it 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 burns and it's i'm like what are you cooking with like i like who in my family has ever used anything but olive oil to cook anything with you know are you kidding me yeah um it's true yeah <laughs> so and of course masakhan, like come on yeah oh geez yes style. with like I'm yeah not, not your fancy or your like you know yeah, re, not, remastered yeah. uh you know rotisserie yeah. No. Although I'm telling you, I still dream about that chicken. I dream about it. I haven't had it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was one of the best experiences in the pandemic for me, to be honest. I gotta say, the highlight was this Palestinian style I chicken. With the it all. I almost risked it all. I on a flight. I, I was about to yeah, risk it. You need to come out here. That should be your ticket soon. So I got to. Yeah, that's amazing. I love the double, honestly, because it's just the concept of having like the Tina base with whatever you feel like. And also we need to like dissolve the misconception about the ball and Baba Ganoush and like all of those things. Yeah, you made that double that one time for that event we were at recently yeah. and it was with what, summer squash? Yeah, I smoked the summer squash. Yeah. It was fire. Yeah. Really good. Sounds delicious. Yeah. That Aleppo crisp cucumber salad you made too. So that like idea came from the Dakka, the Palestinian style, you know, like yeah. I was just making it and I was like, wow, this is in like component wise, like really similar to a crisp. And I was like, what if I just add some pomegranate molasses and hot oil on it? And it like turned into a crisp. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is so cool. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, no, it works really well with cucumber. It's perfectly balanced. Yeah. Amazing. So what's your favorite dish from your restaurant? Mm, honestly, the French fries. Because mm. I spent years trying to master that recipe. And the whole idea with them was to make sure that they, st- since it was all to go, right? Yeah. The whole thing with them was like to make sure they stayed as crispy as they could once they were packaged and traveled and potentially reheated. So there was like a bunch of things that went on in the mastery of that, which I'm going to first tell you. All right. And we cooked them in really low heat oil. We pulled them, we tossed them with potato starch and then flash froze them. Yeah. 
And so then right before we fried them, we hit them a little more potato starch and fried them. And it just like created this coating that allowed them to stay crispy. I have no secrets. Well, we appreciate a chef who can share their secrets. Yeah. It takes more than That's amazing. It takes more than knowing the recipe to bring That's them. 100% true. I can give my friends the recipes to my thing. Yeah. yeah. It's a little extra. It's that love, you know, that yeah, yeah. passion. And competition. <laughs> That's amazing. No. So uh, um go ahead. Go ahead, Ned. All right. No, you. All right. So uh, what we were doing with uh, Z and Z yesterday with Danny, we were, you know, we made him choose, made him decide between a couple different dishes, and we'll start with makluba or mensaf. You have to decide. One has to go. One. Goes. One's gotta go. Which one? One's gotta go. Yeah. Well, oh, you see, this is hard, right? Because I want to be like mensaf is like gotta stay, but like the yogurt is gonna kill me. So <laughs> you do what's best for you. Marcel. I love the nuance in the end. There's got to be some nuance. You know? <laughs> yeah. So at least in Makluba, I can eat and eat and eat and eat to know to no end. But lahma or jaj okay. in the Makluba, chicken or beef in the Makluba. <sighs> I eat so much chicken. So let's see with the laham. What's the best topping on the Makluba? The best topping. Yeah. Like uh like a fried vegetable. Okay. But I mean, peanuts. for me it's the potato. It's the best part of it. I don't know. I'm going eggplant. That's fair. Eggplant? What about yeah. you, Jan? I didn't yeah. ask. I, I love the cauliflower. Yeah, yeah I was like thinking between cauliflower and eggplant, but like Yeah, something eggplant. about the fried cauliflower. Yeah. Chef kiss. And then it's like, you know, like the call, especially if it's like big pieces, right? And it's just like nice and steamy. And then you get some of the cool yogurt in a bite with like the super hot cauliflower. It's like a whole other level. I love Flavor's nuts amazing. on it too. I love nuts on it. Like yes. nuts almonds or all yeah, That's what things. I did on my pop-up. I did the uh, slivered almonds. You know, pine nuts are too expensive. Ah, they're so expensive. <laughs> Inflation. <laughs> Talk about beans. The pine nuts are like $25 a pound or something. <laughs> Dude, saffron is like $188 an ounce right now or something. Oh I feel wow. lucky. I have a friend that came from uh, overseas and brought me like a vial. <laughs> like, I can't tell you where. <laughs> not going to say. But, you know, there's only two countries that really make that, that really export saffron. And uh, I have a vial of it. So it's like literally awesome. gold in my house. I have to like hide it so people don't steal it when they come over. <laughs> Uh, you can sell it by the thread. <laughs> $30 a thread. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Marcel, right. how about uh, what, what are the wali or malfouf? What malfouf and what? What are the wali? What did you say? The wali. Am I cutting out? No, you're good. We got it. Oh, you're good. What are the wali or malfouf, you said? Yeah, yeah one's got to go. Malfouf, malfouf. <laughs> I like the texture. Sorry, guys. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> um, yeah, that's very popular. Yeah, it's like a texture funkiness thing that I really. It's true though. Some people don't like the what up because like it does have like stringiness or. Oh, I like it. I like it just fine. I like all of it. I'll eat all of it all day. But like, if you maybe it's because it's like <clears throat> the. Malfouf is had less frequently, but also then you like can dip it in yogurt, you know. Mm -hmm. Just That's yogurt okay. with everything. That's the one thing I can't get behind that a lot of Arab fellow Arabs look at me weird is I don't eat yogurt, so it's I'm always getting judged. What with nothing? I don't I don't touch yogurt. I can't I can't do it. Wow, I yeah. have to have leban with everything. Yeah, so does my wife. She has to have leban with everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I don't get it. <laughs> like, no. you go to the store I mean, and get leban. You sick, like, your mom would just make you rozu leban, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Not my mom. Yeah, I miss it. <laughs> Maramiya, yes. Maramiya or na'na, Marcel? <laughs> with your shay. What's that? I can't. Maramiya or na'na, with your shay. With your shay. Oh, na'na. 
I'm a huge mint. No, 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 no. Always. <laughs> a funny story. My grandfather had had a garden in his backyard and I was a little kid. And I would go and I just like eat it all. And he thought that like, like rodents were eating it. And he was so confused. Like rodents are actually like, 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 I guess it, it like uh, prevents them from like coming into the area. Technically, mm-hmm. like it keeps them away. Like it deters them. And he was like, where's all my nana like what are you doing <laughs> like what's happening to it like legit one day he caught me out there just sitting there eating it all oh my god that's hilarious <laughs> that's so cute i have a little I love that. that's the only thing i planted <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, all it's, things, right? it's all yeah. you need yeah it, yeah, it takes care of itself too. yeah it does <laughs> yeah once you plant it <laughs> yeah. uh, Janan, do you have anything else for Marcel? Uh, yeah, let's um, give me an I like an like an instance of someone's like best reaction to your food. Besides me, obviously, because I gush about your food all the time. So somebody else, maybe like non-assuming, someone who maybe was not familiar with Palestinian food, because I know that Shababi obviously reached beyond just the Arabs in DC. Yeah. Which, <clears throat> honestly, for me, like, there, so <clears throat> I uh, did a pop-up with Reem uh, Sal um, back in October, October yeah. Because I had COVID, year. I couldn't go, I was so October. sad. So sad. <laughs> um, and that was amazing by the way is we are like, like the kitchen was something else i'm sure it was so, you should have seen me i was cooking bread on an upside down walk like it was like it was nuts it was great um so yeah i was around touching tables and you know we had wrapped up the pop-up at that point and uh, there was a couple there who um had been regulars I didn't know that uh, I never met them before uh, but they came to the pop-up they came to the collab collab dinner that I do with Reem and you know I went up to the table asked you know just, I tried to touch all the tables and talk to everybody that came to them and um they were like they said that they had our shababi postcard on their fridge and that they look at it every day and just reminisce about coming for the chicken every week and oh, wow. that they just can't wait until you know they can have it again and I was like so touched by that it it's a little overwhelming you know because it's I guess I'm just like I want to do great food right and I want to represent my people and I want to represent myself and then, and people are like we look forward to this every week. Like we have pillars that came in every week. And like that was a part of their experience for that whole year, you know? Yeah. And that was really mind blowing to me. And it really becomes part of your relationship and a kind of part of the fiber of what you live for in that week, you know? And to think that it did that for people that maybe had never experienced the cuisine before, especially, you know, um, they took it back in the best way possible. Yeah. It's really humbling, yeah. Yeah, because it's also like, they're also accepting you. Yeah. Holy for who you are, complete, right? Yeah. It's like all the struggles with your identity and finally intersecting them to bring this concept yeah. and they've accepted all of it, right? Yeah. So it feels like really amazing too, because it's not just the food. Yeah. It's the and person it, behind the food as well. For sure, you know, and it, it, it hopefully like allows people to kind of do their own venturing in, a, in understanding, um, I guess, everything that I represent, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So what kind of advice would you have for someone who wants to start a Palestinian food business? Mm-hmm. Not me. Not gonna happen. Anybody else that's out there? 
I think that um, reach out to us, reach out to all of us. You know, I, I've taken some time off of social media this past year. So they really knew that I wouldn't have an opportunity like this kind of ever again um, once things start ramping up, you know? Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> I think the one thing that I realized is community is so strong, you know, and so supportive and, and it's instantaneous. You know what I mean? It's these connections that I've been able to make. It, they're just, they just, we, we meet and then it lasts. Like, that's it. You know, it's true. It, it's, we've been there forever and I couldn't do what I'm doing and I couldn't have done what I've done without the support of all of you, you know? And I think, I think that a person who wants to venture into doing their own Palestinian concept um, should absolutely do it. And I think there's so much that goes into it uh, to, to, to running a business and opening a business in the first place, right? But don't be afraid to ask for help and don't be afraid to ask for support, especially from those of us that have done it before. You know, and that's why I was saying before, like there's no secrets. Like I'll share my recipes. Like I, I don't care. Like, what do I have to hide? You know what I mean? There's just, we're a community. You know, and to uplift each other, we have to be able to open those doors and pass on what we know. You know, that's ultimately like all I want to do. Look, I just make chicken and French fries. You know what I mean? Like it's it's food like <laughs> for us, like uh, us speaking amongst each other. You know, like don't <laughs> like you know. I'm just saying, I I will give everything I know to anyone that's interested in um, coming up in this industry, and I ha- I feel like I was offered the same by many people um, as well. I, I, that to take over our own landscape as much as possible. Yeah, I agree. And one thing that we had talked about, remember at the event, uh, when I was talking about like my pop-ups, you know, and not wanting to like step on any other toes of any other businesses and you said something that was just like very like it resonated which is that there's room at the table for all of us right and you we we talked about you know having multiple arab restaurants next to each other and i was like i don't know about that and you're like but why not yeah why can't we just have all of our restaurants you know in one area you know and just like have like this avenue of all different types of arab restaurant palestinian and lebanese and egyptian and you know, be there to support each other and to uplift each other. And it's true. Sometimes we see each other as competition because we've been so marginalized and we feel like we have to fight so hard for our space. And then that, you know, you start doing something and then someone else, you know, who's also Arab or Palestinian comes in and now you feel like someone's kind of like infringing on your space, but it shouldn't be like that. Mm. We should all be able to make room and uh, to, you know, help, you know, help others succeed, you know, and guarantee success for each other. A million percent. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you <clears throat> see a bunch of American restaurants opening up in one place or Italian or French or whatever, you know, there's not like, wh- why would it matter? Why would it yeah. matter? You know, like <clears throat> there's enough people to eat at the mall and there's enough ideas from all of us. And, you know, and, and also nobody's dish is going to be the same even if they're making the same one, you know? It's um, true. Everyone has their own market. Yeah. And I think uplifting each other, ultimately, like that's, I told you that's my dream is to see us take over an area. And it, you know, like you go to Astoria, Queens, and there's like, oh, you yep. that up too, you know? Or even and, like Bridgeview in Chicago. Yeah. Little Palestine. I mean, it's uh, like a million restaurants. And they're all successful. And we all... Yep. You know, one day we get shawarma from here, one day we get shawarma from there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not exactly the same, right? No, some people make it with the pita bread, some people make it with the wraps, some people yeah. put t- toppings in it, some people just put, you know, only the tenia sauce and that's it. Yeah. And then people go to what they like. And yeah. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Uh, man. Amazing. This has been a great conversation, guys. I just, honestly, I feel blessed to have met you, Marcel. Janan introducing me to another amazing Palestinian chef, another 
bucket <laughs> list when I hit DC. Like I already know like, if I hit DC for a weekend, I got lunch, dinner, lunch, dinner, lunch, dinner certified because <laughs> so yeah. many chefs. we're a little delayed we're a little delayed a little more that's a whole other thing that i'll need to talk to you separately about but yeah we're a little delayed on what we anticipated so we're probably looking at next year but nonetheless like it'll next happen. year marcel i know i know i know but marcel okay, well, i'm just gonna have to special order i know some of but i i was like Honestly, like I'll do catering and I'll find friends spaces and do pop-ups. Like it'll happen. Things will come into fruition during this time. You know what I think we should do? I think you and I should do a pop-up together. Yeah, we definitely should. It'll be awesome. Yeah. I, I so 100 down for that. agree with that. And then I'll fly into DC. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Got you, Nadif. Yes. <laughs> yes. But Marcel, before we let you go, uh, yeah. tell our listeners anything that you would like to know about yourself, uh, anything that you're working on, any projects, just promote it, market it right now, right here. The floor is yours. So we are currently working on Shababi Diner. Like I said, we were hoping to open this year. We're looking at uh, 2023. Um, I just don't think you can rush something like this and it just needs to be done in the time that it needs to be done. But to you know, stay up to date, you can follow us on Instagram at Shababi, S-H-A-B-A-B-I. D I N E R. <laughs> Yay, super speller. Yeah. Uh, probably no underscore in between. I don't remember off the top of my head. There's no underscore. Okay, There's no you. underscore. And we're um, and they better know how to find you anyway. Like it's not. No. Oh, don't worry, we'll tag you on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. uh, you can follow me if you choose. I've been really boring lately, but I'll I'll rip myself up eventually. Uh, you can find me through there. But yeah, like I said, you know, um, Palestinian inspired diner, super excited. In the meanwhile, I might do some catering. So if you're hungry, holler at your boy. Like, <laughs> you know, I don't know. For sure. Um, For sure. Yeah, outside of that, you know, I just hope to continue the good fight in whatever facet that I can um, for all the causes. Appreciate it. Fantastic. I'm so happy that you're not a gatekeeper and that you're, you know, welcoming to all the future chefs out there because we need as many amazing places to eat as possible and we need our people to be the ones who are running everything behind the scenes so that it's you know a million percent. and i don't want to be like my dad still working when i'm 70 so y'all gotta hurry up because yeah, I yeah, yeah. inspire you to <laughs> retire right <laughs> yeah but also if your dms are not flooded with people asking for catering they're all crazy and dumb but anyway we really appreciate your time yeah. Marcel, and hopefully we can follow up with you in 2023 when you open up and inshallah khair. good luck to you and everything. all right thank you. thank you thank you so much marcel thank you all right bye all right, bye guys good night good night